National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. This is the story of the Pacific, the drama of the millions of people who live around this greatest sea where the United States is now committed to a long-term policy of keeping the peace. This is the background story of the events in the Pacific and their meaning to us and to the generations to come. The Remaking of Japan. himself said the war was over. I could not believe it. I was so angry, I cried. The tears fell from my eyes all day. We had lost the war. Soon the Americans would come. We waited. Everything was quiet. When General MacArthur came and his soldiers raised the American flag over the United States Embassy in Tokyo, I could not think how completely the Americans would change a Japan. Your show is an average Japanese, intelligent, moderately well-educated, a white-collar worker. He knew what the men who ran Japan wished him to know, but little more. The Coral Sea? For what battle? He had never heard of the loss of the aircraft carrier Shoho and the other Japanese war vessels in the Coral Sea. Uh, Midway? Uh, No. He had never heard of the disaster at Midway, the sinking of the two big carriers, the Kaga and the Akagi, and the two smaller carriers, Hiryu and Soryu, and of all the other losses there. Kodakana? Oh, you mean our victory there? He had never heard of the sinking of the two old Japanese battleships, Iei and Hiroshima, and of the other Japanese losses at sea and ashore at Guadalcanal. Nor until Japan collapsed had he ever heard of the Potsdam Declaration. Japan's militarism will be eliminated. Japanese war criminals will be punished. All obstacles to the revival and strengthening of democratic tendencies among the Japanese people will be removed. Freedom of speech, of religion, and of thought, as well as respect for the fundamental human rights, will be established. Even after the Americans had come to Tokyo and Yosho had read the Potsdam Declaration, he did not realize what it would mean to him and to all the people of Japan. Conditioned by years of conformity he could not realize that the Potsdam Declaration was a design for the remaking of Japan. Until the United States entered the war, Yoshio had his own opinions about Americans. Uh, They are, of course, uh, culturally inferior to Japanese. He had grown up with this idea. Uh, They are uh, straightforward. They are good mechanics. But uh, uh, they are like people of the frontier. Mostly, Yoshio ignored them. Uh, They are present enough. The military hates them. This is a mistake. The first orders for the remaking of Japan were issued days before Yosho saw the first Americans in Japan. For use of the American occupation troops, the following industries, harbors, shipping, airdromes, and resources will be taken over. The industries located in the island... This was too abstract for Yosho. The terms too general. MacArthur's forces moved in slowly, unobtrusively. They went about taking over the industries, resources, airdromes, and naval bases in the same way. Look at those American warships steaming in. I cannot believe it. You see, the decks are cleared for action. See all the guns? Yes. I did not think I would ever see the day when... when American warships would steam into Omanato naval base. Well, not only into Omanato, but also into Katsuro, Yokosuka and all the other bases. The naval bases were choked with battered and blasted Japanese war vessels. Some were in repair. Many were waiting their turn to be repaired. And some were hopeless hulks, half sunken or beached, mangled by the ferocity of war. Oh, here come the American troops. I will not look at them. Perhaps they will put us out of here. 
From now on, we will have no right here. The Americans took over the naval bases and the shipping yards where the vessels had been spawned which once had driven American warships from the western Pacific. The Japanese stood by mutely. Some of them turned their backs. But there was no turning their backs on what was happening to the Japan they knew so well. On September 10th, an 18-word order staggered them to their heels. The Supreme Command for Allied Powers has directed that the Japanese Imperial General Headquarters be abolished, effective September 13th. With a single stroke, the Japanese high command was wiped out. The war makers who had terrorized East Asia and the Western Pacific for years suddenly were mere men, unimportant men, with glittering insignia and samurai swords that meant nothing. Suddenly, the stern-faced generals were almost pathetic, almost ridiculous. This, Yosho could sense. <laughs> We to have no generals? What is to happen to our army? Under the Potsdam Declaration, Japanese militarism is to be eliminated. Entirely? All his life, Yoshio had been taught the righteousness, the spirit, and the power of the Japanese armed forces. Now this. What about Japan's millions of soldiers and sailors? To Yoshio, the armed forces had been the instrument for getting Japan what Japan needed. He was not exactly clear about the significance of the Imperial General Headquarters. To him, it meant solemn generals and military secrets of great magnitude. And now it was gone. All this was on the abstract side for Yosho. Specific things he understood much better. Quick, get his shirt off him. That's it. Shot himself just under the heart. All right, get that plasma ready. Get it into him as fast as you can. Now then... Let's have a look at this wound of yours, Tojo. Things like this, Yosho understood. Why did he not commit harakiri as he should? He misread the emperor. He did not let us know how the war was going. He deceived us. I hate him. In the next few days, Yosho learned more about Tojo than he had ever known before. And with what he had read in the newspapers, he learned more about the progress of the remaking of Japan. The end of the war had left him bewildered. Now he was becoming more and more aware of what was taking place. Japan has been reduced to a fourth-rate nation. Japan will not be able to wage another war within the predictable future. He read these words of General MacArthur in the newspapers. And the Zaibatsu, the wealthy family combines which for years have dominated Japan's industry and commerce, made some cunning maneuvers. Uh, look at this in the paper, Yoshio. The Japanese big business... Appeals to the United States. Oh, what do you think of that? The Zaibatsu making a roundabout appeal to America for food and cotton and money. Are oh, the Zaibatsu asking for help? Yes, private loans. Well, do you think America will lend it to them? I think the Zaibatsu is trying to find out something. I do not understand. The Zaibatsu may be trying to find out how they can save themselves. It uh, must be obvious to everyone that the Zabatso are now trying to raid the frame of the war on the militarists. It was the militarists. It was also the Zabatso. At every turn, they tried to strengthen their hold on our economy. It was the Zabatso which would have gained most if we had won the war. If they did not pull the strings on the military... At least they worked hand in glove with the military. The Zaibatsu have covered their trail well. And now they are trying in every way to escape their responsibility. But Yoshio learned that the Zaibatsu could not escape responsibility for their part in the war. By order of the Supreme Command for Allied Powers, the four largest Zaibatsu were ordered to dissolve. A spokesman for the Japanese industry, which they controlled, presented a harikiri sword to the American officer ordering the dissolution. Uh, since you are forcing Japanese industry to commit a harikiri, perhaps you would like to hold the knife? The Zaibatsu had been called to Yoshio's attention in a way in which he had not thought of them. 
when the arrest of 40 Japanese militarists, politicians, and members of the Pearl Harbor cabinet as suspected war criminals was ordered, he looked for the names of the Zaibatsu. Hiteki Tocho, Shigenoro Togo, Takinora Kaya, Hakuno Shimada, General Homa, Ichi Uchida, Colonel Hashimoto, Kishi. He knew nearly all the names by reputation. Generals, philosophers of aggression, slithering politicians, leaders of the Black Dragon Society, blustering admirals. Maruta, Naganama, Ota, but uh, there are no names of the Saibatsu, no industrialists, no big money men, no political party leaders. Why is this? More names were to be added, Kurusu and Nomura. Toshio, one-time ambassador to Rome. Matsuoka, the whipcracker and sword rattler. General Hanjo, one-time commander of the notorious Guangdong army. But uh, uh, where are the names of the Saibatsu? Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Yasuda, Sumitomo, Iwasaki, and the others? Are they not a war criminals? The terroristic Black Dragon Society, which for 40 years had been the instrument of Japanese militarism and aggression, was order dissolved. And still more changes were made. The newspapers, though some of them had been more outspoken than ever before, found themselves in hot water. Well, what have we done? All copy is to be submitted for censorship before it is printed. Oh, yes. It must be remembered that the Japanese Empire is no equal of the Allies, but a defeated enemy, which has not yet demonstrated the right to a place among civilized nations. The tone of the colored news you've been printing gives the impression that the Supreme Commander has been negotiating with the Japanese government. Oh, it, uh, it was not intended? Because of your failure to submit news for censorship, the publication of your newspaper is suspended. Suspended? The suspension was lifted after 24 hours. But with this came additional orders. Effective at once, the news services of all nations will be permitted to the Japanese press. Government news will no longer be available solely to the Domai Agency, but will be available to all foreign and Japanese news agencies. That means that the government will no longer control what is printed in the newspapers nor what goes out to the mail, or in telegrams, or by telephone, or any other way. How much has the government kept from us? Yoshio got the answer to this in short order. Look, a motorcycle escort. Uh, yes. This must be something important. Yes. Look at the big limousines that the motorcycles are reading. Uh, they are driving up in front of the United States Embassy. See, that car. It is the Emperor's. The Emperor's! Then the Emperor is going to visit our General MacArthur. But bow! Bow quickly! Do not look! Think of it. The Emperor visiting the United States General. Forty minutes later, the Emperor came out. August solemn Hirohito drove back to the Imperial Palace as Tokyo and all Japan buzzed with bewilderment. The prestige of our Emperor has been lowered. All our lives we've been taught that the Emperor is supreme. No, it was not good. It was not good. The Emperor should have granted General MacArthur an audience in the palace, and General MacArthur should have gone there to visit the Emperor. This is not good. Oh, perhaps uh, this will make better friends of the United States and Japan. But what did our Emperor and General MacArthur talk about? The newspapers carried stories of the historic visit, the first event of its kind in 2,600 years of Japanese history. But suddenly all newspapers carrying the story were gone. Also gone were the newspapers that carried pictures of MacArthur towering over Hirohito. Supreme Headquarters cracked down. Why weren't these papers distributed? The Home Ministry ordered that they not be distributed. Why? The Home Ministry said it would have a bad effect on the people. This is a violation of freedom of the press. There is to be absolute freedom of the press. No news is to be suppressed. Yes, sir. All newspapers carrying the story of the Emperor's visit or the pictures of the Emperor with General MacArthur are to be distributed. The newspapers came out. But the importance of Hirohito's visit was played down. Also, its significance. Actually, the imperial visit was arranged solely out of the imperial will. The people must not think that the emperor had been called to Supreme Headquarters. The call was made of the initiative of His Majesty. <laughs> The Japanese world Yoshio had known was falling about his ears. Now he was beginning to understand the meaning of defeat and surrender. He became sensitized to the rapidly changing scene. But what could be in the document that the Americans gave to Premier Higashikuni? It must be important. 
The American officers have been working on it for days. Yosho waited. Then he found out. The Japanese government will remove all restrictions on freedom of thought, religion, assembly, and speech, including discussion of the emperor, the imperial institution, and the imperial Japanese government. The Japanese government will dissolve all political police or any other organizations employed to enforce restrictions. The Japanese government will discharge Home Minister Iwao Yamazaki, also the chief of the Bureau of Police, and all metropolitan and prefectural police chiefs. The Japanese government will release all political prisoners. Premier Higashikuni got the point. He and his entire cabinet resigned. In his place, Baron Shidahara, forum, former ambassador to the United States, formed a new government. But all this did not dull Hirohito's gleaming importance to Yoshio. We still have our emperor. He is what counts. To Yoshio, the emperor had scarcely been touched. But when Yoshio stopped to contemplate how Japan was being changed, he was still in humiliation. He received with apathy the news of the new premier's order abolishing bayonet drill and jiu-jitsu. He scarcely took note of the statement of the Supreme Headquarters, which followed. Nothing could exceed the abjection, the humiliation, the finality of this surrender. It is not only physically thorough, but it has been equally destructive to the Japanese spirit. At first, Yoshio had thought the changes in his life would be only nominal. As the impact of the changes struck him, he began to understand that the changes would be sweeping and tremendous. And they were. Here's the list, sir. Yes. Mm-hmm. Fifty-eight million ounces of gold bullion, eh? Yes, sir. It's valued at $250 million. And uh, what is this? Platinum? Yes, sir. I see. 33,400 ounces. Yes, sir. And 27 million yen in silver coin. Mm-hmm. All this was seized from the Japanese government, the army, the navy, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of Indochina, and several lesser sources. What about the emperor's personal fortune? It amounts to something more than $106 million in gilt-edged securities. A good deal of real estate, more than a million dollars in actual cash, and some millions in art treasures and jewels. The emperor's fortune will be used to pay reparations. Yes, sir. Any distinction between the emperor's fortune and the assets of the Japanese government? None. Yes. Sir. For the time being, these reserves will be kept under our guard in the vaults of the Imperial Mint and in the Bank of Japan. No chances were taken that the reserves might disappear. All this was too far removed from Yoshio's world to have real meaning to him. All he knew about money was that he had never received much of it, and that what he had received had been heavily taxed. His principal concern was for his emperor. Uh, how can they take the emperor's money and permit the Saibatsu, which for years has amassed great fortunes, to keep theirs? The answer to this was not long in coming. By order of Supreme Headquarters, the Japanese government will tax away the war profits of the Japanese firms and individuals. There will be a capital levy ranging up to 70% on all fortunes. Now this is good. Now, instead of the wealth being concentrated in the hands of a few, it will be more equally distributed among all the people of Japan. This was Yoshio's reaction. If it meant less money for the Zaibatsu, it must mean more money for the common people. But how it would accrue to him as one of the common people, Yoshio was not sure. All he knew was that it gave him a feeling, despite his resentment, that the basic changes being made would, in the long run, make things better for him. This feeling was deepened by the action taken against the great landowners. You see, Oshio, the Americans say that almost half the farm households of Japan have only about one and one-half acres to work on. Oh, yes. Their land is crowded. Yosho, being a city man, could hardly appreciate how crowded it was. And most of the farmers are tenants. Eighty percent. Eighty percent do not own their land? Uh, that is what the Americans say. They must give half or more of their crops for a rental. It is the big landowners who have property. Yes, the absentee landowners. They have always controlled the farmlands. And they have kept the farmers so poor, they could never buy their land even an acre and a half. They are worse off than we are in the cities. That is what the Americans say. Uh, see here. They say that uh, even with the farmers who till more land than one acre and a half, 
Uh, the average farm is less than three acres. And they are the ones we must depend on for food. Uh, they are the ones. And the landowners have kept them so far in debt that they could never buy their land, even if the landowners would sell it. To break this vestige of feudalism, Supreme Headquarters took sharp action. By March 15th next, the Japanese government will abolish absentee land ownership. The Japanese government will make provisions for the small farmer to buy the land he tills on long terms at low rates. The economic bondage which has enslaved the Japanese farmer for centuries will be destroyed. The effects of the directive were sweeping. I can buy my land? This was the Japanese farmer. How? How can I? I have no money. And I am in debt. Ways will be worked out to help you buy your land. But more dynamic, if immediately less apparent, was another result. Its effect on the Zabatsu. Some of the powerful family combines have considered posing as landlords to save themselves. They considered with their trust broken up that they could still retain their power and influence as landowners. But under this American order, they can find no refuge in land ownership. Now they are checkmated. Yoshio went about his work. He received with indifference the news of the crushing of the narcotic industry. He knew that Japan had for years produced illegal drugs, but he did not know that in one year the Japanese had produced enough for 30 years legal supply. Let the Americans destroy the narcotics industry. But when he learned that the institutions that drugged the minds of the Japanese also were to go, that was another thing. <laughs> They are interfering with our religion. No. They are taking steps to see that neither our religion nor our schools are used by the military. But they are talking against teaching about our sun goddess at Matarasu and the sacredness of our emperor. No. They object to the teaching of the sacredness of the emperor and about the sun goddess with our history. They say that our history should be confined to facts. And I say this is right. Who are they to say that the sacredness of our emperor and that he came down from the sun goddess Amaterasu are not a fact? We have been taught many things that are not facts. What was fact and what was not were interwoven into a tight fabric, a creed in which one was almost indistinguishable from the other. The task was to untangle them, to say what was fish and what was fowl, and to allow each for what it was. Japan's old system of education must be eradicated. The Americans made an exhaustive study. The students of Japan must be taught their relationship to the past and to the world of today and to the world of tomorrow. To a Japanese reared and educated under the old system, this was a bewildering innovation. But what does this mean? It means that Japanese students must be brought up in the ways of peace rather than the ways of war. Oh, yes. It means that the Japanese must be taught the meaning of representative government government in which the people rule themselves. Oh, yes. They must be taught the dignity of the individual. Yes. They must be taught the right of free speech and assembly and religion. All these were concepts of democracy that Yosho could only dimly understand. To bring them about would require a thorough overhauling of the entire Japanese system of education. It would require tearing some things out by the roots and planting and nurturing of other things. To accomplish this, Supreme Headquarters issued an explicit order. The teaching of ultranationalistic ideologies is prohibited. Military drill in schools is abolished. Well, this will destroy our traditions. All educators who are militarists and ultranationalists will be removed from teaching. I have taught loyally the ideas I was taught. Uh, is it wrong to teach national ideals? All educators who have been dismissed because of their liberal views will be restored to their positions. I did not think I should ever see the day when I would be permitted to return to my classrooms to teach. The Americans are right. All discrimination because of race, nationality, creed, or political opinion will be prohibited. We have only tried to protect the pure blood of the Amato race, but now we have lost the war. There is no other choice. The Japanese public at large will be taught the theories and practices of representative government. The Japanese public will be told the part played by the militarists and their collaborators who committed the nation to war with the inevitable defeat and distress which they are suffering today. The public of today was to be told how the war came about and who promoted it. And by the same process, 
The public of tomorrow was to be educated away from the policies that led to the war. But it was necessary to go even deeper. It was necessary to separate the fact from the fable, the history from the legend. For the state had used Shintoism as something more than a religion. But just as I said, they would not stop with changing our educational system. They would also tamper with our religion. Yosho read of the investigation of state Shintoism by the Americans. The state used Shintoism as a tool. There are only about 17 million Shintoists among the 70 million people of Japan. But the state used Shintoism as a compulsory religious ideology. The investigation was thorough. Are you, you a Shintoist? Oh, no. I am a Buddhist. Were you prevailed upon to adopt Shintoism? The school where I was educated was obliged to install a Shinto shrine. Were you taught Shintoism in school? Uh, yes. Thank you. That's all. Now you, uh, what is your religion? I am a Christian. Where were you educated? In Doshisha University in Kyoto. Yes. Doshisha University resisted Shintoism as long as it could... But at last, it was obliged to install a Shinto shrine. Did you accept Shintoism? Not in place of Christianity, but it was compulsory, so there was no escape from it. That's all. Thank you. How effectively Shintoism had been used did not become apparent until all the findings were in and piled fact upon fact. Bluntly and boldly, the sum of it all was set forth. The state used Shintoism as a channel of militarism. With it, the militarists reached into every home they tied the people to their policy of aggression and with it bolstered the mass morale of the nation. With it, the militarists kept the people in line behind their policies. To Yoshio, who had been indoctrinated with state Shintoism, this blunt analysis was almost incredible. It meant he had been duped with a glorious promise of better things and that he had gained only misery and distress and humiliation. He had seen the destruction of his world around him. Now even his thinking was to be changed. All government control and support of state Shinto, the way of the gods, is to be withdrawn. This was the directive. All militaristic and ultranationalistic ideologies will be removed from the doctrine of the Shinto cult, which teaches ancestor worship and the deity of the emperor. All Shinto teaching will be removed from schools. I said that they were interfering with our religion. No, they are not interfering with Shintoism. You may continue to be a Shintoist, and so may all the other Shintoists. But state Shintoism, as the government enforced it on all of us Japanese, will no longer be permitted. How could it have happened? How could so many of us have been misread? I can hardly believe all this now. I could hardly believe that the war was ended until the emperor himself told us over the radio. Now I have no more anger. All Japan is being changed. Even me. have been listening to The Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross-currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. May I repeat, for a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. The Pacific Story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. Your narrator, Gain Whitman. Programs in this series of particular interest to servicemen and women are broadcast overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. This program came to you from Hollywood. 
This is the National Broadcasting Company.